top British immunologists sent out a clarion call to anyone who will listen that the COVID-19 mRNA vaccine platform appears to be a dead end. They warned that the current booster strategy, the new influenza-style approach of annually tweaking the vaccine, seriously underestimates the complexity of the current challenge to the COVID virus. That, my friends, is the subject of today's show. And so, from Trial Site News, I am Adrian, and our episode is starting right now. With 70% of the population targeted with mass COVID-19 vaccination, herd immunity was promised as a natural positive outcome by the promoters of the COVID vaccines early on. This was communicated far and wide by places like the World Health Organization, the National Institutes of Health, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and countless other agencies. But the question arises, how could you accomplish this with a non-sterilizing vaccine that failed to fully stop viral transfer targeting a pathogen, the RNA virus that mutates frequently like influenza? Of course, it didn't take long before the value of the vaccine was pivoted to focus on the reduction and morbidity and mortality rates. But the 70% targets remained, along with the unethical pervasive mandates. And by the summer of 2021, the platform failed to neutralize and with mutating variants became ever less durable. Worse still, the experts that tried to call out this issue early on in the pandemic found themselves either ignored or censored. And so here we are in 2023. A recent editorial in The Lancet, Infectious Diseases, by a pair of scientists from Imperial College of London, both of whom are immunology experts, stated that as we enter the fourth year of the COVID-19 pandemic, rather than having a clear path to herd immunity, instead we face a far less certain tomorrow. The pair of highly respected British immunologists include Professor Rosemary Boynton and Professor Danny Altman, and they reveal the COVID-19 vaccination reality of today in surprisingly frank terms. Despite this unprecedented mass vaccination program worldwide, they say that societal attempts to live with the virus have relied on hybrid immunity, meaning the measurable plus non-measurable tangible and intangible protective benefits afforded by both vaccination and the natural immunity bestowed by pre-existing infection. Now, after reviewing the comment, imprinted hybrid immunity against XBB and reinfection, it becomes clear just how much we have missed the mark with the mass vaccination program. Although the most recent bivalent vaccines are adapted to BA.4 and BA.5 in the United States, those pathogens disappeared months ago. But the Imperial College London immunologists point out that less viral sequencing tracking leads to far less certainty as to what any particular variant is doing worldwide. But what about differential immune imprinting after tracking the various combinations of infection and vaccination? Well, the authors raise first a couple of points, including that hybrid immunity from the pre-2022 antigenically distant pre-Omicron variants failed to confer protection against XBB reinfection. They observe a new biomedical interface arose during the pandemic from the iterative rapid exchanges between real-world national cohort epidemiology and laboratory mechanistic immunology. The British immunologists warn that it is a serious matter, stating, that the high prevalence of breakthrough infections is evidence of us failing in our war of attrition against the virus measurable by increased caseload, hospitalizations and healthcare provision, lost days from work, chronic disability from persistent symptoms, and an inability to simply return to normal life. Among the immunological challenges is the imperative to better define the rules underpinning the differential immune imprinting exemplified by these findings. The authors here point to Tan and colleagues from Singapore who feature epidemiological observations back in the concept of differentially imprinting hybrid immunity conferred by previous infections during the period in which the Omicron variant was dominant. With this data in mind, the authors report, disturbingly, how little we really know. Here's what they said. They said that this data set from Singapore reminds us not only how far we are from understanding these imprinting rules, but also how great would be the benefits of understanding them better. 
And then the authors raise an even more ominous note. The immunologists point out that potentially we are arguably even further from decoding the details of differentially imprinted immune waning. Coming into the pandemic, immunity to reinfection by the human common cold coronaviruses was understood to be short-lived and fragile. However, in the case of SARS-CoV-2, it was hoped that protection would be increased by highly effective vaccine platforms. Sadly, of course, as we have seen, this has not been the case. The authors then present a possible fork in the vaccination road, or worse, possibly a dead end. They said that if we now appreciate that even hybrid immunity to SARS-CoV-2 infection is differentially, depending on previous immune experience, poorly durable and annual debates on booster strategy are required, how should we move forward? The two immunologists have a message as well that may be targeted at America's health bureaucracies, places like the FDA, the CDC, and the NIH. They say that they don't think one can just keep tweaking the vaccines and produce an influenza model, which, by the way, is a lousy model in the first place. No, instead, Boynton and Altman report that the data set from Singapore reminds us that suggesting the booster strategy will simply involve tweaking vaccines annually, as for influenza, seriously underestimates the complexity of the current challenge. So what is the answer here? Well, considering the current approach is failing, they don't say that directly, but that's precisely what they are implying strongly, the only long-term strategy involves what the academics refer to as, quote, considerable effort towards the development of both next-generation vaccines, for example, targeting neutralizing epitopes that are actually conserved and difficult for mutations, and vaccine platforms that provide durable local protection in the nasal mucosa, thereby blocking viral transmission. So with that being said, what is the takeaway on the mass COVID-19 vaccination scheme? Well, it depends on one's point of view. Yes, the vaccine products, especially early on in the pandemic, the first part of 2021, for example, created surges of robust protection, but it was short-lived. And by the time the Delta wave began, breakthrough infections became rampant. And this doesn't even account for the gargantuan expenses that we incurred in fighting the virus this way. For example... Here in the U.S. alone, we spent over $4.6 trillion fighting the virus, or $4,600 billion if you prefer. The COVID response strategy has locked us into a commitment to a platform that was supposed to be flexible and robust, but turns out to be not much of either, if these two top immunologists are to be seen as correct. But the next question is, will anyone in leadership listen? As of now, it appears doubtful. All you have to do is consider the atrocious response by practically all government institutions around the world with their lockdowns, authoritarian social restrictions, the destruction of human freedom, and so on and so forth, which, by the way, long term accomplished nothing when it came to halting the virus from spreading. Sure, short term, the lockdowns and social restrictions appeared to slow the COVID virus from spreading. But as soon as these restrictions were eased, the virus went right back to spreading. And in the end, after all that misery, loss of wealth and incredible psychological damage that we inflicted on our population at large by isolating the human race, it appears as though nothing at all was gained by these efforts. No matter how hard politicians and bureaucrats might try and gaslight you into thinking their response was right. And justified. When I think of how many people died alone in hospitals with their families banned from coming to see them, it makes my blood boil. What right did the government have to force so many people to die horrible deaths alone, with no family or friends able to come see them in their final moments? What an abomination the restrictions turned out to be, leaving our most vulnerable in society to be left alone with nothing but anxiety, loneliness, and confusion imparted on them these past few years. It was monstrous. When you couple this with the inability by our government leadership to recognize their mistakes along the way, at least not until the negative effects are so obvious that they risk citizen revolt, it doesn't leave much in the way of confidence that our fearless leaders will be able to adjust their strategies until it is far, far too late. And that, my friends, will bring our episode to a close once more. For more content like this, be sure to check back to this channel daily, Monday through Friday, or for written articles posted every day, seven days a week, feel free to visit us at trialsitenews.com. And as ever always, my friends, thank you so much for joining me on the program today. 
From Trial Site News, I am Adrian, and I will see you all next time.